Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I want you to, re- to remind you it's youth month. So I believe we can act accordingly. Praise God. Amen. Amen. My name is Joshua uh, Gikandingare. It's a pleasure to be here. It's such an honor. And as Pasi has said, I'm an aspiring theology student as well as uh, hoping to pursue engineering. But today, it is the Lord who has anointed me to come and minister to you, and I shall do so. Amen. Yeah. Um, before I begin, there is something Pastor Silas forgot to do. For the ones who are first-time visitors, lift up your hands again. Tuone, tuone. Amen. The church, we have something that we say to first-time visitors. Let us say together, your search for a church has come to a blessed end. Amen. And now, uh, also, I'd like personally as a youth to call on the youth and the high schoolers, the crossroaders. This week it's DVBS. I personally will be participating and ministering to the children. I want to ask you, my age mates, come and we shall minister to the children. As you've heard, I am an alumni of DVBS, if there's such a thing as an alumni. (laughs) But, yeah. So, as you've heard also, it's going to be, this month's theme is Radiator's Garage. And this is now going to take a slightly different angle from what we have looked at in the other months. In January, we were introducing the theme of the year, which is radiating God's glory. In February, we looked at characters who radiated God's glory. And in March, we had the exposition from Reverend Dr. Thu, which talked about a portrait of a church that radiated God's glory. But this month, it goes to a personal level because now it is us as radiators going into the garage. And for today, we are going to start by diagnosing the problem. Okay? So even as we begin, uh, let us close our eyes and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace that is extended toward us. And we thank you for your strength that you have blessed us with. And even as I stand here today, you have ordained me this day and given me the words to speak. And as I speak to each of us, let us, each of us, even I, learn from what you have to tell us today. Minister to us, convict us, let us be repaired in this garage. And even as we diagnose the problem, O Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and work in us as you have promised us. This we pray, believing and trusting in your name. Amen. Amen. So, um, we are going to start by understanding and analyzing what is a garage. And before I go on, I have to give a disclaimer. We're not talking about the garages we know here in Kenya. You know here in Kenya, you can take your car for a tire change, then you leave the garage with a new engine. We're not talking about that. (laughs) Here, we shall be analyzing what an ideal garage setup is. We come to understand what goes, what's a garage, and what are the operations that take place inside a garage. We're also going to look at why we should take our cars to the garage. And after we've established that, now we are going to also now come and take what you have learned from that and look at what a garage is for us as believers and as a church as a whole. And I'd ask the media team to move to the next slides as we work together to take a look at what a garage is. You can go to the next one. By definition, okay, a garage might be, might be confusing to some people. The garage we're talking about today is an auto repair shop. Because you know there are also the garages where we keep our cars at home at night. That is not it. Today we are looking at the workshop. And by definition, the gar- a garage is a workshop where vehicles are taken to be worked on. That's, I think, the simplest explanation I can be able to give. 
concerning a garage. And in that garage, there are many things that are done to the vehicle. And now we are going to take a minute or two to look at that. The first is repairs and maintenance. When we take our cars to the garage, that is, I think, the most basic thing we think of when we think of a garage. Repairs and maintenance. When your car has a problem, you rush it to the garage. When you need to have your service done, you rush to the garage. And so anything, whatever repair that is needed, from the simple tire change you can do at home to a whole engine overhaul, all of that can be done in a garage and can and is done in a garage. Then you have the routine maintenance, which we'll know as the service. After a certain mileage, you take your car into the garage and, uh, of course, it's to ensure the car is in tip-top condition. But also now maintenance is not limited to just the regular service. Some of us have cars we've had for over 10 years and they may need that occasional sprucing up. You may need a paint job, maybe you need to upgrade the upholstery, your seats and the carpet, you need to change them and keep the car in good condition. That's part of maintenance and that's the main idea of what happens in a garage. For those of us uh, who own commercial vehicles here in Kenya, there's something called inspection. How many of us have heard of it? Vehicle inspection, very good. So, uh, it is required by law that vehicles undergo inspection. And this is because the car needs to be certified for roadworthiness in accordance to the standards of that country's laws. And in the UK, actually, it's not just uh, commercial drivers. Everyone is required to have their car inspected. And the process normally is, especially here for Kenya, you take your car into the NTSA yard, a government mechanic has a look at it, and then they give you a list of all actions that need to be taken. You know, if you have a pickup and maybe the headlights are damaged or the reflectors need replacing, he's going to give you a list of all those actions. And then you'll return to the garage and those actions will be taken upon your car and then your car will be certified for roadworthiness. And of course we know that is very necessary for road safety. We do not want to have cars that are a risk not only to the driver, but also to other drivers. So it is very important for vehicles to undergo that um, inspection and to be certified as roadworthy. Another issue, or rather operation that takes place in the garage is the diagnosis of known and unknown problems. In the garage, I think most garages, I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I can believe every garage, there's this huge thing that looks like this tablet, and it's usually a very dense device. It's called a diagnostic computer. And many of you may have seen it, many of you may not have seen it. This device is plugged into your car, and what it does is it runs through every part of the vehicle's electronics and it analyzes every problem, it, even problems that are unknown, and sometimes even mechanics use that to identify problems they know, but they don't know where they are located. So they connect this device and it runs through every part of the car. And I think the way I've witnessed it most is speed sensors, these things that the result that show you the speed on the speedometer because there are four of them in a car. And when one of them gets spoiled, the speedometer won't work. And if you are caught by the police, that's of course a huge problem. But this device can be able to identify which one of these four instruments are faulty. And from there, of course, now the mechanic will be able to proceed and repair accordingly. And also because the issue has been identified where it is and it has been isolated, it can also be repaired effectively. So that is generally what a garage is about.
what 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 goes on in a garage but the question is why do we take our cars to the garage I think we can move to the next slide why do we take our cars to the garage we've seen the various things that take place there and again i want to remind you we are talking about an ideal garage situation here yeah, because if you have the kenyan garage in mind you may think i'm lying to you by what i'm about to say next so let's please focus on an ideal garage setup <laughs> uh, First and foremost, it's because we do not know how to repair the cars ourselves. We do not have the technical know-how or the capability to repair that car ourselves. So we take it to someone who knows. You know, and even if we may have a knowledge or an idea of what the problem is and what we may need to repair, we may not have the equipment that is necessary to, uh, or even the capability uh, in terms of our own strength and such to repair the cars ourselves. So you take our garage, that is I think what leads us to take the garage to, uh, our car to the garage, sorry. The second, and I still insist this is an ideal garage situation, it is because the mechanics are trustworthy and reliable. <laughs> They know what they are doing. And uh, because the, you can entrust them, because they, first of all, they have that expertise. You can entrust your car to them and be sure by the time you're getting it back, it is in good condition. Whatever issue that was to be repaired has been repaired. And now you can go back home knowing your car is in, is in tip top condition. condition. Uh, yeah, so now, that is what a garage is, an ideal setup of a garage. And just to recap, you've seen what takes place in a garage as before I move on. Just to recap so that we can now be able to move into what a garage is for us as believers. A garage is a place where repairs and maintenance takes place. Inspection and certification of roadworthiness and also the diagnosis of known and unknown problems, which now actually, now this diagnosis is also crucial to the part relating to the repairs because it enables those repairing the vehicle to have a better understanding. It's like when you go to a doctor, when the doctor performs scans and tests to know what is ailing you, they have a better idea of understanding the proper course of treatment and they'll be able to administer it to you. So now let us come and look at what a garage is for us as believers. And simply we are going to take what we have learned and now compare it in a matter of the heart, sorry, in a matter of the heart. And the answer to what a garage is for us as believers, it's very simple. It's the word of God. The Holy Bible is the garage for believers in the church. How so? It is where we find our repair and our mending. You know, sometimes we may feel broken. We may feel there is something troubling us inside us. But haven't, haven't, haven't you ever just sat and read the word of God and felt it working in you and through you? It, you feel it repairing you. You feel it healing you. Because the Holy Spirit, who is the mechanic, comes and works in us through the Holy Bible. And he is able to repair us and mend us where we are broken because of the word. Again, it is also where we find our routine maintenance. It's common human, or it's a proven human concept that things done frequently increase longevity. We see the proverb, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. 
practice makes perfect. Consistent practice makes perfect. Even taking your car for that routine maintenance gives it a longer lifespan. And the same thing is for the word of God and us. If you want to live a healthy Christian life and live it consistently, having that same balance, we have to consistently go back to the word of God, read it, meditate upon it, act upon it, and we shall live a, a stable life. And we take that from 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, which says, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. You see, Jesus tells us he's the way, the truth, and the life. In John chapter 1, we see that he is also the word of God. And that's why you put the connection that because Christ is in us, the word is in us, we shall not make a practice of sinning. We shall be in a life of holiness and righteousness because we are children of God. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. Amen. And now we've seen that. And we have to look now also at diagnosis. And it is what we'll be looking at today. The Bible has the power to diagnose and identify our deepest problems. We look at Hebrews 4.12 again, and it says, The word of God is alive and powerful. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hey. Anyway. A machine door, but I will say the verse nonetheless. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, even to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It exposes the deepest thoughts and desires of our hearts. So that is what the word of God does in a very simple sense. You see, as I was reading this verse, I took notice to the fact that it says soul and soul. You see, the soul is a bridge between the body and the spirit. And so it is the point where even the devil can make a connection between you as a human being and your spirit which relates to God. Therefore, when the word of God comes in you and you let it work in you, it is going to separate that link and prevent any work of the enemy from coming and attacking your spirit. You see, and in doing so, um, yes, I'm back. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, yeah. Uh, the word, it comes and it also now exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Other version says it judges the motives and attitudes of our hearts. What does that do? You see, as I said earlier, diagnosis is the identifying, the perusing and identifying of problems. So the word of God, it identifies what the problem is, and then it exposes it. It now brings you to knowledge and understanding where the issue is. And moving further, it is also where we are certified for the kingdom of God. In other words, it is our benchmark for a healthy, functional believer and church. It is where we are instructed on how to be compliant to the kingdom rules and values. There is no way about it. If you want to be certified for the kingdom, if you want to make that entry into heaven, again I'll repeat, Jesus said this is the way the truth and the life. No one enters or goes to the Father except through me, he says. And he is the word. So therefore, there is no other way we as believers can make it to the kingdom of God without the word of God. It is also where we see 
how a Christian is supposed to live. It is our benchmark. Everything a Christian needs is in the word of God. And we therefore have to keep looking unto it and seeing uh, where we need that repair in order to be certified. Do you remember I said during inspection there's that list the NTSA gives you and you take it to the mechanic. Therefore the word here it gives you that list of repairs that are needed. And now you go and ask the Holy Spirit, please come, work in me, so that I may be fit for the kingdom. And now, we ask, let's ask ourselves, why should we, as believers, take ourselves to the garage? The answer is basically the same as before in the physical garage setup. We as human beings, it is a proven fact, I, anyone cannot tell me otherwise, but we do not have the manpower to resolve issues of the heart and of the spirit. Whether we want to, whether we don't, even psychologists can do so much, but they cannot go to the point of fully resolving the issues of the heart. And that is why we need the word of God to come in us and fix us. We cannot do it on our own. Therefore, we go to the one who is able to heal us and repair us and keep us fit for the kingdom. The mechanic, as I, as I said, who is the Holy Spirit, is trustworthy. God is not a man that he, that he should lie. We are told in the word of God. He is not a man that he should lie. He is trustworthy. So we can entrust ourselves to him and we can rest assured that we are in safe hands. And I'll read to us Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 to 3. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burnt. The flames will not consume you. And this is the important part. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 So we see here clearly the Lord has, this is a promise, it's a declaration. You see, it's not a suggestion, it's a declaration God is making to us that we should not fear, fear not, because he is trustworthy. We can go through all matters of troubles, we can be broken in so many ways, but as long as we are in the hands of the Lord, we are in safe hands. Now we can move on to the analysis and now take a look at the scripture of the day. Now, as I remind you, the theme for the month is Radiator's Garage and the scripture is Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 6. But for the analysis of today's word, we are going to look at Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 1 to 17. And that is where we are also going to derive the diagnosis and why we are reaching to that point of diagnosis. So I'd kindly ask us to uh, open along with me, and I'd, if possible also, yes, very good. Uh, we look at Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1 to 17. And I'll be reading in the NLT version. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. I hope you, everyone has reached. Okay. The Lord said to Jeremiah, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So as I did as he told me and found the potter working at his will. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to this clay? As the clay is in the 
potter's hands, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I had planned. And if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then that, but, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless it as I said I would. Therefore, Jeremiah, go down and warn all Judah and Jerusalem. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. I am planning a disaster for you instead of good. So turn from your evil ways, each of you, and do what is right. But the people replied, don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as we want to, stubbornly following our own evil desires. So this is what the Lord says. Has anyone heard of such a thing, even among the pagan nations? My virgin daughter Israel has done something terrible. Here's the interesting part. Does the snow ever disappear from the mountaintops of Lebanon? Do the cold streams flowing from those distant mountains ever run dry? But my people are not so reliable, for they have deserted me. They burn incense to worthless idols. They have stumbled off to the ancient highways and walk in muddy paths. Therefore, their land will become desolate, a monument to their stupidity. My goodness. All who pass by will be astonished and will shake their heads, heads in amazement. I will scatter my people before their enemies as the east wind scatters dust. And in all their trouble, I will turn my back on them and refuse to notice their distress. Wow. For me, verse 17 is a very scary verse. It's an extremely, extremely scary verse. Now that you have seen the word of God and what it says, now let's take time and break it down. I'm going to break it down section by section. We're first going to look at verses 1 to 6. That is the revelation of God's message. Then we're going to look from verses 7 to 12, the call for repentance and the nation's response. Third, we're going to look at the delivery of judgment, because that is what we see here. So let's first start looking at the delivery of the message. As we see in the scripture, the first thing God does, and it's something he used to do a lot with prophets in, of the time, he would send them out to a real life scenario and give them a message from there. Remember Hosea, Hosea God asked Hosea to marry a harlot just in order for him to give him a message of how Israel was in the relationship with God. But here we see Jeremiah has been sent to a potter's shop. And upon arriving, we see the first thing Jeremiah notices is the potter is working at his will. He's very busy. You know, it's, for him, it's just another day at work. But the timing of this uh, occurrence is also very unique because by the time he arrives and notices that he's working, he also realizes the job he's working on is not turning out as he had hoped. So as Jeremiah is watching, the potter takes that clay and crushes it again and starts over. He makes another new jar out of it. In fact, in NIV, we see the Bible say the clay was mud in his hands. In, and it is after this, witnessing this occurrence, that God gives the mes uh, Jeremiah the message that we see in verse 6. He is asking Israel, Oh Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to it, it's, uh, his clay, to the clay? And then he tells Israel, because you see, he wasn't expecting Israel's answer. This is the Lord speaking. He goes on to affirm, Israel is like that clay uh, in the hands of the potter. And that is very important 
for us to remember. Please remember that as we move on to the next points and the, we, as we continue the breakdown. After that, we see God moving on and now asking the nation to repent. And this, this section gives definition to what we see in verse 6. Uh, God is telling Judah that if a nation is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, but they, run, but they renounce their sin and repent, God too will relent. And one interesting thing to note, I don't know if you may have noticed it, the wording in verse 7 is almost the same in all versions. The three words, uprooted, torn down, and destroyed. As I was writing my sermon, I did notice, and I found it to be of particular significance that it is said like that, because it is an explanation of what God had said to do. It was, that was the sequence of God's judgment upon this nation that was sinful. But the Bible says that if they turned from their sin, God too would reconsider the judgment he had set for these people. Inversely, we also see that if a nation is to be planted and built up, that is to be blessed. If a nation is to be blessed and to be made prosperous and to grow and be abundant, but it falls into wickedness, then God too will reconsider the good he had intended. And we see this actually even with Israel. The many times they sinned, then pop, famine struck. You see, it was God reconsidering the good he had intended for the people. And when we look at verse 6, let us differentiate, because this is a scenario of a portal, let us differentiate this verse and other passages uh, regarding potters and clay. You see, such as the quote in Isaiah 45, which uh, God asks the nation, surely can the pot ask the potter, why did you make me this way? You see, there God is telling the Israelites, or rather even the pot, I can make you how I want. And even as we see, Isaiah repenting still in chapter 64, he prays to God and tells them, and tells him, we are the clay and you are the potter. You made us in this way. So you see those two different scenarios refer to God's sovereignty and free will to do anything he would want because after all, he is God, he is our creator. But here, this takes a slightly different approach. Verse 6 is God telling us, it's affirming to us that he is free to respond to us in accordance to our own moral conduct and choices. Um, because you see, he's, and you see that in the example he's given between verses 7 and 10, where he says, if a nation is sinful but they repent, I will not destroy them. But if they are, they are to be blessed, but they turn wicked, they will be destroyed. So, we, that point is God telling us he's going to respond to us in accordance to our own moral choices. But in verse 12, we see Israel's response, which even for me was very, was very shocking. Because Israel at this point was so wicked they had completely abandoned and disregarded the matters of God, that they blatantly dismissed the warning. And you see here, at when God is coming and telling Israel this, he's warning out of love, it is out of grace that he's coming and telling the nation, please repent, because I do not want to have to punish you. God is a holy God, God is a just God. So sin must be punished at the end of the day. But that is not God's desire for us. That was not God's desire for the nation. And that's why he came and asked the nation to repent so that he may relent from judging the people. But Israel simply said no. In fact, they told Jeremiah, you guy, you're wasting your breath. Like we already, like what, why are you coming? You already know us, we are going to 
disobey nonetheless. We are going to walk with our, by our own evil desires as we have continued to do. And it was, you see, technically, it's like they were basically telling Jeremiah, you are talking to a rock. We are we're like, you know, they, they were so stubborn, they were, their hearts were so hard that they affirmed to Jeremiah, they were like, it was like as though they were talking to a rock. And as we move on to the third part of this section, verses 13 to 17, we see the delivery of judgment. And when we look at verses, especially 13 to 15, I realized God reacted in a way even I have not seen in the Bible again. He was shocked. He was appalled. He was, it was almost in a state of disbelief. He asked the nation, who has ever heard of such a thing, even among the pagan nations? Meaning what Israel was doing was even strange to nations that worshipped other idols. He asked, who has ever heard such a thing among the pagan nations? Then he goes on to explain, my virgin daughter Israel has done something terrible. Does the snow ever disappear from the mountaintops of Lebanon? Do the cold streams flowing from those distant mountains ever run dry? But my people are not so reliable, for they have deserted me. They burn incense to worthless idols, they have stumbled off the ancient pathways and walk in muddy paths. Now, to understand this better, let's look at the pagan nations and what, why they are mentioned here. You see, all the nations that surrounded Israel were all idol-worshipping nations. And these idol-worshippers had one thing that was extremely that was common uh, regarding their faith. And they were extremely loyal and devout to their faith and their deity. In fact, them, they, it was almost, it reached almost a point of fanaticism. They were fanatics. We can see that even how that influenced Israel. We look at the case of Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. Remember how these people were praying to the very extent they began cutting themselves, as was their tradition. They used to cut themselves, trying to woo their God into action. But Israel was simply not as devout as they were. And it's very ironic that pagans were, uh, were loyal to a worthless idol, an, an unliving God. But Israel, who, whose God was the one true living God, the creator of heaven and earth, had abandoned their own God. They had adulterated their faith and they'd left the ancient highways of morality. And to explain what ancient means, ancient means it has been proven. You see, because it has stood the test of time. But they left those ways and went through crooked and muddy paths, which are the paths of wickedness. And there was also, also a lot of false doctrine spreading in the time of Jeremiah in Israel. People were coming and trying to spread some heresy in the nation, and the people seemed to embrace it. But in verse 16, we see God saying, he is going to make the nation desolate as a monument to their stupidity. You see what God is doing? He is acting in accordance to the nation's morals and conducts. Their moral conducts, that is. So you see, because their minds were so desolate, God in turn would make that manifest in the physical and the land was to become desolate as well. And then here we see God condemning the nation into exile because he says the land, the people will be spread such the way the dust is blown by the wind of the east. So they were to be spread out of their land and we see that coming to pass shortly after, and the nation is condemned. This part of scripture also is important because now it is where we connect this passage to the church today. 
There is a significant percentage of Christians in the church, believers, people who claim by name at least to be people of God. But they have adulterated themselves with worldly principles and they have abandoned the kingdom principles and they fail to live against, against, uh, to live against the moral dictates that are found in the word of God. People who have simply claimed, they claim to be Christians but wame potoko na akili, they have, that is they have really, they have been depraved of their minds and have left the word of God to pursue things of the world. And that is very, it's a huge problem. If you analyze the church today, the church today and Christianity as a whole has become something of a laughing stock. Muslims, they are there always ridiculing Christianity. In Kenya, we see 80% of, Christian, of the nation are Christians. But also, the level of corruption among the citizens is nearly as high. So, you, you know, there is not, when these statistics are being made, it's not like there is a sudden influx of foreigners who come and rig the polls. No. It means that those people who still claim to be Christians are also the ones involved in corruption, in sexual immorality, in all forms of worldliness. We deceive people. We go on Sunday. In fact, not, these are people who make Christianity a religion and not a lifestyle. For them, Christianity is only about what happens on Sunday, not about what happens from Monday to Saturday. For them, it's only simply just about Sunday. But you see, God is already talking of a disaster that is being prepared for them. And the reason we are judged so harshly as Christians, it's not just for any reason. The word of God, it is already known to the whole world, the kind of morals that are demanded in the word of God. So when people see, now these people, the world, consider them now the pagan nations that we see in Israel. When we see them, when they look at us, they are perturbed because they are like, wow, these people, they have such a high moral standard, yet they choose to ignore it. And these, moral, high, these standards of living, we can see that they clearly benefit them. It is for their own good, yet they still choose to be rebellious and abandon such principles. And as we move on, and we've seen how that applies to the church today, I want us to move on and look at a multidimensional interpretation. And the interpretation here, what we are interpreting is verse four. The verse says, but the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay and started over. And we see this actually explained in two ways between verses 7 all the way to the end of the chapter. For you see, first is the people, God asking the people to come voluntarily and allow the Holy Spirit to come and crush them and remold them. The other, we see, is God reforming through judgment. And to give us an idea, when, your car, when you notice there's a problem with your car, you can either choose to listen and heed all the warning signs and take your car to the garage voluntarily, or you can choose to ignore those problems and the car will break down in the middle of the highway. And now all you'll have to do, you now be forced to take the car to the garage to your own detriment, and it will be at a greater cost. Uh, Therefore, there are two ways. So what God is telling us here is, come by yourself. I'm giving you that chance. Come and be broken and, or refuse and you'll be crushed. And we see that in Matthew chapter 21, verses 44. I'm running out of time, so I'll move a bit more quickly. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone it falls on. So you see, it, those, there are those people who fall over the stone and they will be broken. You see, the kind of remolding process will be less severe. Then we see 
a people who uh, fail to listen to that first warning, that early warning, and they will be crushed. When the time of judgment comes, they will be crushed. Uh, as I move on, I just have to move a bit more quickly. But we see, as I've said, again, to look at the car. It will be more costly. And actually, we see that with the nation of Israel. Exile and captivity was probably, or even definitely, the worst thing that has ever happened to Israel. But you see, as much as we may not know about what happened in post-captivity Israel, we never see an account of idol worship again. They were purged. God reformed them. As much as other issues came to arise, God reformed them. And now we shall quickly move and look at the diagnosis of the problems that the church is suffering today. And the first is simply sheer stubbornness and rebellion from the people of the church and the believers. We see that in Israel, in this passage, where the people were simply so stubborn and that led them to their own destruction. And please do not be deceived that that cannot happen to the church today. It can. As I go back, let me just quickly tell you about God when he, what he speaks about in verse 11. You see, he says he is planning a disaster. In Hebrew, the word for planning, or as other versions may say, you know, framing, preparing, forging, that word in Hebrew is yoza. Yoza has the same root as potter. Therefore, God is curating a judgment unique to the people and how they sin. And we look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, as we look at the stubbornness and the rebellion, especially the part of rebellion. Jesus tells the people, and he was speaking to the Pharisees, anyone who is not with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. See, stubbornness is an unwillingness to change. That is a crippling, it's a crippling factor for us as Christians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that we belong to Christ, therefore we are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So whenever we try to insist upon our old paths, we are simply denying uh, that Christ We then go and look at the worldliness and uh, acceptance of false doctrine. Now here I'll just recap what Pastor Thu taught us last week. And he mentioned Philippians 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 18 and uh, 19. And Paul tells the church, why well, I've told you before, I say it again with tears in my eyes. There are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And they think about only this life here on earth. But what, we, what does the Bible tell us about worldliness? Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both. And we see, and he actually, Pastor Thor gave us an example of some of the students he lectures, and he does a, he is teaching a theology class, but he asked the people what, what was their purpose of trying to get this uh, more education. And a lot of them, it was very carnal. They wanted to get higher paying jobs, you know, be pro more prosperous in their own corporate settings. Their pursuit is no longer the kingdom, as the Bible tells us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will come to pass. Instead, now their focus has shifted, and that moves us to part three. Their focus has shifted from Christ, and it has now come to worldly things. And as we go and look at the loss of focus and purpose in the church, we're going now to look at Hebrews 12, 1 to 4, which, uh, you know, it talks about how we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses. And therefore, let us put down every weight that sets us down, and let us run the race with endurance, so that we can be able to, we are being watched, in other words. And then it tells us, set your eyes on Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith, and so on and so forth. 
And you see, that part tells us that when we lose focus on Christ, uh, we are going to be distracted. And I'm being told, uh, Masai Meisha had really planned to come on and finish. Allow me just not to just go on and read the rest. And uh, hopefully we can cover the, more on the second service. It leads to many distractions and leads to weariness. Let, uh, that is, you can find it in Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. And then we have pride, which we see in James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, and verses 13 to 17, where pride is a sense of self-entitlement and self-worth above everyone else. In simple terms, it's thinking that you are better than everyone else, and it also applies to this holier-than-thou mentality that exists in the church and among believers. And we see also in the case of the Pharisee and the tax collector who Jesus witnessed in the temple. In the temple. Another thing that is a crippling factor, and there is not even a need to quote a scripture on this, because we know how much Jesus hated it, it's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in the church is a very dangerous thing for believers. And it is the one thing you can see Jesus clearly, he showed hatred for hypocrisy. And as we move on, I know we may not have been able to cover the diagnosis, but as we conclude, uh, I just want to ask us, as we've seen, we are diagnosing the problem. We've seen some of the problems uh, that hinder the church from moving on and that condemn the church to destruction. But you see, God has extended the hand of grace. In this time, we are in a dispensation of grace where Jesus came himself and died on the cross so that we can be reformed one more time before that moment is gone and gone forever. So have you allowed the Holy Spirit through the word of God to diagnose you? We've sat here during the moment of Holy Communion and we have been asked to consider, to examine ourselves as the word of God tells us. Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to come and diagnose you and convict you and repair you and maintain your hearts and as we see in Hebrews, free us from the sin that so easily besets us. Be it lust, be it corruption, be it an addiction to pornography or alcoholism, be it love of money, be it even hatred. Have you asked the Holy Spirit to come and take those and purge you and take those issues that burden you and set them aside? Let us remember the goal. So in order to avert worldliness, we need to keep our eyes on the cross and to keep our eyes on Jesus. The moment we take our eyes off Christ, we are giving the devil a foothold. So let us continually remember to have our eyes on the goal. And remember the Holy Spirit is there to help us. That is his job here as an, uh, ordained in the word of God. And let us also have a habit of consistent Bible reading. We looked earlier and we said, that we are being certified for the kingdom. So we must meditate on it, learn from it, and pray without ceasing. And as I close, I'll read to us James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word of God and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you carefully look into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So even as pastor comes to pray for us, remember we are ambassadors of Christ, and we must strive to live a life representative of him. Reflect upon that moment we've just shared of the Holy Communion, and ask and examine ourselves, that is it said, judge yourself so that you may not be judged. Because the judgment of God is that of wrath, and we do not want to suffer that wrath while we're still in the period of grace. So repent and turn from your ways, as we are told in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Now repent of your sins and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away. Amen. Amen. We are so thankful 
You know, these are moments that pastor doesn't know the things that are in here. But now they are coming out, they are getting manifest. Now this month, this is what you are going to experience. Pastor sitting and you seeing our sons and our daughters rising and uh, blessing us. Interesting, in this congregation there is one lady who is the same age with my first, uh, firstborn sister. She saw me in nursery school. <laughs> So me, Nasali, I was finding it humorous that now I'm here pastoring her. And she honors me a lot, you know. I am amazed. She saw me in Nasali. Imagine Nasali. I visited them in high school when I was, they were in a girl's school and I was saying, I want to come to this school. I didn't understand there was a girl's and a boy's school. <laughs> She's here. She's fellowship here. She honors me. I was, it's, it's interesting, Joshua. She, he's here. She honors me. She saw me in Nazareth. So it's not, it's not about Nazareth and what? It's about Jesus. Amen. And we trust in God that our youth, our young people are going to impact the world and also minister to us. Wasn't that great? Have you heard it? Please appreciate Joshua. Thank you, Joshua. Father, we thank you for this, our son, and the word that has come through. We thank you for the ministry of your word that has come from his heart and through his tongue. We receive it and we say, thank you, Lord, help us. I will surrender to you, Jehovah, with uh, this um, type and uh, the way we have been taught through uh, about a garage, that, Lord, this car that gets there has to be released to the expert. And we pray that you will help us, that we will reflect on the things we have heard and you give us understanding even as we separate ourselves and will not be stubborn like Judah who said no and ridiculed your uh, prophet and your word. We will be different. Lord, I pray that you will help us through in the name of Jesus.